And welcome everyone to another Smart Money Circle episode. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is Paul Kellenberger, who's the CEO of ZSpace. Ticker symbol is ZSPC. Paul, thank you so much for taking the time and welcome to the Smart Money Circle. Thank you, Adam. So Paul, I always like to begin. Can you please tell us your story and how you got to where you are today? Sure, happy to and and um, happy holidays here. We're headed into that season. Um, I like to tell people I'm a tech guy through and through. Spent um, the first uh, big chunk of my career with two big public technology companies. Both of them no longer exist. One eventually got uh, devoured by HP and the other one into Google. Um, so I've been in technology my entire career. I moved to Silicon Valley 26 going on 27 years ago and got into startups. This is actually my fifth startup, ZSpace, the first one that um, I've been a part of taking public. And um, the, the unique piece about the company um, kind of embodies a lot of my own experience. So it's actually 19 years with the company uh, from the very, very beginning um, with ZSpace. Very nice. And then I, I love that you're a technology guy through and through. So it's very clear on what you do and your passion and, and your work. Let's talk about ZSpace. Please tell us about your company and all the great things you have going on. Sure. So um, the roots of this company are, are somewhat unique. We were actually uh, really started as a government contract or government project for the first, I'll call it almost half life of the company. And uh, the government was looking for something like ZSpace, which is this very unique, interactive, augmented reality solution using display technology or a laptop. Um, we concluded that contract. And like a lot of uh, startups, what we thought was going to take 18 months took a lot longer. Uh, it was a lot harder. The positive was we filed a lot of patents and got a lot of IP along the way. But we moved into the commercial market. And this was in the 2014 timeframe. Um, you know, this is before Oculus uh, got on the market and, you know, Meta eventually acquired Oculus. We looked at a lot of different markets. And at the time we had to make some tough decisions uh, about where to go into the markets and um, made the decision and really got drawn into the education market. And the education market, the way we look at it and the way we um, view it is, is really two segments today. Uh, the K to 12, um, predominantly public schools, although we're also in uh, privates and charters, and also in um, uh, the career and technical education market segment, which is the old traditional trades, welding, automotive, HVAC, as well as some newer applications, AI, programming, uh, robotics, advanced manufacturing. And from 2014 until last year, we IPO'd literally, it's almost exactly one year ago on NASDAQ, um, we built the company. It's a combination of uh, hardware, software, small amount of services. The software is the recurring piece, which is a tremendous amount of value. And the overarching drive in the company and the vision in the company has really been to improve student learning. And with the move more and more into career and technical education over the last uh, four or five years post COVID, it's also really about getting students, kids engaged in learning in areas they may not normally have gotten engaged in. And by the way, the original story I like to tell, um, 2014, 2015, there was a, a um, superintendent of a small school district out here in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. And um, their teachers um, and students had seen ZSpace and we were not, uh, this is the very beginning of the, our education journey. And um, I went in and I was meeting the superintendent and he said, here's the reason we want ZSpace in the schools. And they were selling us to come into their market. And at the time it was about younger girls, think of middle school girls, grade five, grade six, grade seven, and um, science. And so, you know, younger girls don't necessarily want to be cutting up a dead frog, a uh, frog cadaver. You could do that virtually. And it gave the opportunity for students to get into uh, deeper into learning in, in initially with STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. Now, fast forward through today and um, as a company, uh, we're in over 3,500 of the uh, 13,000 public school districts in the U.S. Most of our business is in the U.S. Um, we have a really good team of people here in the U.S. 
Um, it was originally about student engagement, getting kids excited in learning in certain uh, topics with very immersive experiences. Um, we have all kinds of efficacy data now, studies that show that ZSpace improves student learning. There's one out of Texas Tech that I'd like to point to that shows grade scores for middle school students on average went up 16% in science and math. Let me stop there, Adam. Yeah, I absolutely love it. So you're, what you're saying is, well, I, okay, so I have a daughter. <laughs> I, have a, I have kids too, son and also. But my daughter, when she was dissecting a frog, years ago when she was younger she didn't like it i remember that day very clearly so what you're saying is you could take that augmented and augmented reality in a vr type headset have them go through not just that experience but other experiences as, as well and not actually have to physically get in there and dissect the frog or whatever that learning situation is maybe it's more advanced learning later on down the road and you can all you can do that with virtual reality as one application is that a good way of summarizing what you just said it is, but just to clarify, there is nothing on your head. So okay. ours is purely augmented. Um, lots of videos out there on our website where these objects are projected in front of your laptop, just like your laptop in front of you. But this is a unique uh, Z-Space laptop. <clears throat> and with a stylus, you can interact with them. By the way, that's the middle school um, uh, story, if you will. If you go into more high school and it could be um, somebody really interested in science, um, we have an application that is the entire human anatomy. So again, I'm using the same cadaver example, but we're, we go well beyond science. Um, and you know, we have a, um, a body, virtual body, that is anatomically correct, that can be used in high school, can be used in, in colleges and universities as well. Um, but, but you've got the concept. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, thank you for clarifying. So it's not an Oculus VR headset, it's a displayed on the actual screen, but you're almost in an augmented world on the screen in front of you on your laptop or your computer. Correct. correct? Okay, yep, wonderful. correct. Thank you for that clarification. It. And that's just one application. I mean, obviously this is can be applied anywhere from, I guess, military to education to commercial uses, pretty much anywhere. Is that, I mean, are there any limits to your technology? You know, the only limit is having the the software application, the content itself. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about, again, in the K-12 segment, it was really initially focused on um, science, technology, engineering, math, the STEM acronym. In the career and technical education side of it, I mean, we have welding, automotive, HVAC, um, advanced manufacturing, robotics. We have all kinds of applications and content. And again, post COVID and, um, you know, in terms of funding, it's really one of the areas that has bipartisan support um, and more and more. And, I'm, and, you know, it's very difficult uh, to, to find people with trades. And there's also those newer applications. Everybody wants to be in AI, AI programming as well. Got it. Makes perfect sense. Thank you for that. So let's move on now to some timeless lessons that you've learned along the way. Paul, you've been very successful as a CEO of a publicly traded company. You've worked at big tech companies over the, the decades. What are some less, or timeless lessons you've learned along the way that you'd like to share with the audience about business, life, relationships, anywhere you want to go, please? Sure. Well, um, since you mentioned relationships, I think relationships are what, what this is all about. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you've got the best widget or whether you are selling financial services or whatever, relationships are really, really um, key. Um, you know, my own philosophy on a lot of these things is um, about getting the right people, the best people, the old Jim Collins, uh, good to great, get the right people on the bus, um, you know, get behind them, support them. Um, and those right people are the ones that are going to really help. Um, and I would say in, in my own experiences over many, many years, uh, many, many companies, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of uh, really, really talented people. And everybody says that. Um, by the way, it's, it's, it's harder to do that and keep it together than necessarily um, to go and do it once. I think the other um, couple of items that I would put in the um, um, category of things that I have, have at some level been really um, important is, you know, kind of the hard lessons and, and hard decisions. Um, you always look back and like a Monday morning quarterback saying, geez, I should have done this. And um, but no matter what you do, you need to be prepared to make those hard decisions. 
it isn't all about um, everything up and to the right uh, always. Um, and then I think the last item that I'd share, and maybe this one is a is a personal one, is being very persistent. Um, my um, my father was a, a building contractor and went through many ups and downs in his own um, in his own business in his own career. And every every startup that I've been with um, it has has had its own cycles of ups and downs. But um, with the right people um, making the right and sometimes very hard decisions um, and being persistent, um, success uh, usually follows. I absolutely love it. Yeah, actually, that's a common theme here on the show. Somebody gave me a great line uh, recently. It goes, relentless consistency. <laughs> I, like I that. absolutely love that. So, yeah. all right, uh, let's talk about the other side of that. Timeless mistakes, Paul, that you've either you've made, you've seen other people make. I know some people self-sabotage. Anywhere you want to go, please. And how do you learn from them so you don't repeat them and avoid them? Yeah, you know, I think um, the one I kind of sort of just mentioned is the the Monday morning quarterback. It's always hard to know when you're in the thick of things and in the fog, what is that right decision? And um, style wise, I'm very collaborative and like to be an includer, but I always tell people you have to be prepared to make that decision and go in whatever direction. And somebody I worked for years and years ago at Motorola, which was one of the big tech companies, he always said, Paul, go ahead and make a quick decision, even if it's the wrong one. You can correct it before your competitors have even made a decision. So, um, you know, I think if if it's the one thing is about making those decisions quickly. And again, it's very difficult too many times um, when you're in that um, that that moment and in that situation. Um, but it's one of the ones that, you know, I continue to refine and work on. Yeah, it'll set you free. I, I absolutely love that. So it's, in other words, avoid that analysis paralysis where you just stare at the screen, you don't know what to do, and then just go it gets caught in your head, and then you're gone. Like every, your competitors have taken off and done five, four or five different things without you, and you're just sitting there just at the drawing board trying to cross every T and dot every I. Okay, um, thank you for that. Let's talk about adversity. Being successful, you have to overcome adversity and or hand, overcome obstacles. How do you handle adversity? Yeah, you know, I, I'm one of those people who tends to um, um, just kind of power through and, and stay focused on whatever the goal is. Um, <clears throat> you know, the mentally, I'm one of those people who loves to, you know, um, make sure I get my daily workout. So I'm an early morning guy, just got off my elliptical and um, just to keep my frame of reference. And I think that helps because you're always going to have adversity. You're always going to have obstacles. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about this company that after um, many, many years, um, we have no real competition for for what we do. And you mentioned the the VR headsets. Um, they've tried an education and, and I'll say that they failed. They've gone into different markets and had different success. Um, again, we're a little bit different, but we we don't have any real competition in our market. And by the way, I'll go a little deeper on your adversity comment, this has been a really challenging year for almost every company within the education market within the United States, given all the administration's education policy changes and the changes to the funding and whatnot. Um, and I, I believe we're, we're through all of those changes. So that's been, that's been a year, this has been a year where very challenging in, in a lot of adversity. Um, and we've, we've made a number of different changes in different areas to to deal with that. Um, and I think that's, you know, kind of back to the make those changes as quickly as you can is the, the most important thing. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question for you. Let's talk about leadership. What makes a great leader? And what are some lessons about leadership that you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, um, you know, again, I think this is um, stylistic is getting the most out of your people. And I think that goes to at least my own personal style around uh, being inclusive and making sure everybody's individual voice is heard. Um, and at some level, some level of um, dissonance or conflict uh, is okay because um, as long as uh, you can bring the people back together and, and ultimately we make the right decision for the business. I think those are in, again, in the way I think about things, you know, one of the, one of the biggest things. Um, and again, um, change is a constant in, in I think any business, any market, 
um, change is always happening. And then it's how do you go and react to that change in, in the market or within the business? Yeah, I love that. Okay, thank you for that. Final question for you today, Paul. What is the best piece of advice you'd like to give the audience or your 30-year-old self? Yeah, you know, um, I think ultimately it comes down to believe in yourself. And um, I, I tend to be a, a play hard, work hard, uh, and uh, hard work pays off, so to speak. And again, I think that goes to the theme of persistence as well. So um, if you believe in something, um, stick with it, give it all you got, and um, you'll be successful. Absolutely love it. Well, Paul, thank you so much for taking the time today. Congrats on your success. And hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Sounds good. Thank you, Adam. Much appreciated.